Good morning, One Million Cubs. How's everybody doing today? Hey, Tyler. Uh, please help yourself to some coffee, some tea, some water. Uh, we're gonna get this show on the road. Uh, to let you know who I am, I'm John, one of your community organizers. Uh, we have Kyle, we have Nicole, Billy, Tyler's in the back. Everybody turn around and say hi, Tyler. Uh, if you could do me a favor, take out your phone, check into the One Million Cups app. Uh, you'll be able to find out more information about our presenters, uh, provide them with feedback. Uh, feedback is the most valuable part of what uh, One Million Cups is about. So what we're going to do is we're going to have two presentations today. Uh, when the presentations are done, we're going to have our expert, expert panelists uh, uh, ask some questions. Then we're going to open it up to the audience to ask questions. So we encourage everybody to ask questions uh, to give these companies some feedback. Uh, and I would like to introduce our expert panel. Good morning. My name is Leslie Walton. I'm a network navigator at KC SourceLink. So we help get um, entrepreneurs and small business owners connected to the right resources at the right time. So I'm happy to be a panelist today. Hi, uh, good morning. My name is Tom Sokola. I'm a Lean Six Sigma Master Black Belt, and I just founded uh, 14 Points Consulting, specializing in uh, continuous process improvement for small to mid-sized businesses here in Kansas City. Thank you for being here. Uh, and without further ado, we're going to get started with our first presentation. So everybody, please give a warm welcome to Alex with Equinox and Solstice Outdoor Company. Okay. Hey, what's up, everybody? I'm Alex. I'm the uh, CEO and co-founder of Equinox and Solstice Outdoor Company. We are located in Lawrence, Kansas, but we love coming to Kansas City. I want to introduce you to uh, a couple people real quick. So first, let's meet Mark. Mark is an architect in Kansas City. He uh, has his dog. His dog's Lucy. Uh, he loves spending time outdoors. And Mark really wishes that he had a chance to contribute more to his community. He always rounds up at the register. So this is Mark. Now let's meet Michaela. Michaela is an eighth grader at Eudora uh, in Eudora, Kansas. She gets really good grades, but unfortunately her family was homeless last year. She's been wearing the same jacket that was her uh, big sister's for the last three years. And her, her mom is a single mom who uh, has two jobs to support her and her sister. So now let's talk a little bit about the problems that Mark and Michaela have. What do they need? Well, externally, they both need good, versatile clothing, just like all of us. But what's Mark's inner need? Mark wants to make a bigger impact in his community in Kansas City. So according to market research done by the Outdoor Industry Association, uh, the core consumer issues, uh, there are three that people are looking for in brands in the outdoor market. They're taking, the brand's taking visible, visible positions on social issues to make shopping more personal to, uh, to customers and to make purchasing an experience. That's what com consumers are looking for. So let's look at Michaela's inner need. Michaela wants clothing that helps her fit in. According to the U.S. Census Bureau, the, from 2016, more than 13 million children live in poverty in the U.S. One in five kids will be homeless by the time they're 18. One in five. And a lack of appropriate clothing leads to bullying, illness, and truancy. And people don't think about this, but one of the most powerful stories I've heard are two brothers in the, in the California, L.A. area had one pair of pants between them. So each of them would skip school on alternating days so they could wear the pair of pants to school. So let, now let's meet the Northward jacket. And I brought one with me, but I, I was going to wear it. It's a little too warm on stage. So the Northward jacket, it's water resistant, windproof, ultra breathable, and it's very versatile. You could wear it between 20 degrees and 75 degrees. It's professionally designed by Jessica Hammer. Jessica spent five years as a senior developer at Under Armour, uh, and she's been in the outdoor space her entire career. And it's responsibly sourced. We check and vet all of our manufacturing partners in Southeast Asia to make sure that they're up to the highest uh, production quality, uh, labor quality, and material sourcing quality. So now let's, let me share a little bit about our mantra. It's called Wear One, Share One. This is the way that Wear One, Share One works. So somebody purchases an item. Pretty straightforward beginning. 
We contacted one of our nonprofit allies that lived near the purchaser to identify a need, to identify a kid who has a clothing need in their network. We give a gift card to that nonprofit ally to give to the kid. The kid gets the gift card from the nonprofit ally and they get to go on our website and order the same product that the, the original consumer bought in whatever co size, color, and style that they like. So they're getting not only the, the base layer of Maslow's hierarchy of needs met, the physiological layer, but also the emotional layer above that, and they get a little self-expression out of their clothing to reduce the instances of bullying and truancy. So after the gift, are, the gift card is redeemed, we follow up with that original customer, Mark in this case, and we let him know, hey, look, Michaela in Eudora, Kansas, just redeemed the jacket that you bought for. That way, our consumers are also benefiting from the transaction emotionally. So let's talk a little bit about uh, where one share one a little bit more, and so you can get a little more detail of how it works. We built it so it unite, unites Mark and Michaela's inner needs. It's a hyper-local one-to-one. Hyper-local meaning the donated product goes within 50 miles of the purchaser. So how do we do that? Well, uh, we, first we serialize the donations for transparency so we know where all the donations are going. And then we have nonprofit allies nationwide. So let's talk about our nonprofit allies. This is the distribution for all the donated products. Generally speaking, we work with three major partners, Communities and Schools of America, Boys and Girls Club of America, and Big Brothers Big Sisters of America, but we don't work with those national organizations, we work with the local organizations. And I know for a fact, one of our biggest partners in Kansas City is Big Brothers Big Sisters of Kansas City. So if you, if you in the audience, hopefully you will, uh, go buy one of our jackets, then a, we can send that donated product through Big Brothers Big Sisters of Kansas City. We have 230 partnerships nationwide and growing with organizations such as these and more. Uh, we use their existing infrastructure for identification of the kids in need and for distribution of the jackets. We can build a relationship with literally any 501c3 in the country. We work with homeless shelters, we work with obviously mostly youth development organizations, we can work with literally any 501c3, and we give them a lot of uh, 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 latitude to use the program how they see fit. We also try to use them as a passive sales force. Since we have such a hyper-local uh, uh, idea with, our, with our, one, our wear one, share one, that means if somebody in Detroit buys a jacket, a kid in Seattle is never going to see the benefit from that. And we let our partners know, if you motivate your networks in Seattle, then Seattle kids are the ones who are going to benefit from this. And we try to push that nationwide. So the value proposition, we're trying to change the value proposition in the outdoor space away from incremental product improvements towards value driven by social impact, which is something that we think a lot of consumers are feel is necessary. We have a very small business feel in our customer engagement. We can call it Midwest Qualities. We're very highly social in our marketing and engagement with our customers. Lauren is here, she's our marketing director. And we tell stories of change. One of the benefits that we have over any other uh, brand in the outdoor space is we can tell real stories of change, not just from the kids' perspective, but also from the consumer's perspective. So, some of our growth challenges. Well, this is a highly competitive market. Uh, apparel is the second highest rate of, of uh, failure uh, behind restaurants. The capital needs for new product development and inventory are incredibly high, especially for a startup. Uh, Long-term product develop, uh, diversification, one of the issues a lot of one-to-ones one have is they get known for a product. Tom, this is probably the one you guys are thinking in mind. And they're suffering right now. Their debt-to-income uh, ratio is 15 to 1 because they only sell one product even though they've tried to diversify. And, of course, as any startup, building brand awareness is going to be incredibly important for us. So. That's it. Thank you for coming, and I'd love to hear your questions. Good morning. Uh, congratulations, by the way. I think this is a fantastic idea. Thank you. Um, so you said that your products, um, the, the raw materials are sourced from Southeast Asia. Is that where it's manufactured as well? It is, and that's, that's kind of industry standard because of the cost of labor. No, I get it. Um, so how adaptive is your supply chain to, to creating these new products, to delivering something specific to, for a different customer? Mm -hmm. um, have you researched that, how long it takes, the cycle time and stuff yeah, like that? The reason that we went with Innovatex as a partner is because they specialize in apparel uh, 
uh, in outdoor apparel, and they have hundreds of manufacturing partners in Southeast Asia. We basically give them our designs that Jennifer creates. They shop it around uh, different shops in Southeast Asia, usually China. They give us the best price per unit, and then they get back to us and give us some options. Now, one of the things that we let them know is that um, our um, transparency is incredibly important to us, and so being able to identify their partners who have very high labor practices and, and source material responsibly is something that's important to us, and so we do pay a little bit more for that, but we think that it's important for our customers to know that not only are we being socially responsible from the one-to-one -one end, from the wear one share one end, but also from the product manufacturing side. So I think they're very responsive because they're professionals in the field. They've been around for a lot longer than we have. Thank you. Thank you for the presentation as well. So I see that you are aware that you know it's a highly competitive market, you know that you need capital, you know you need to have diversification of your products as well. I did not hear you mention what your price point is for your product. And really, I don't know exactly who your target is. Mm -hmm. So I'm not sure if it's the homeless, you know, if it's nonprofits, you know, so can you kind of Sure. Elaborate on that a so little bit. So our target customer would be somebody, I'm going to answer that part first. Our target cu customer would be anybody in here, well, unfortunately doing this during the summer doesn't work as well, but anybody in here wearing a Columbia something, a Marmot something, a, a North Face something, a, a, you know, any number of the outdoor uh, uh, brands that are that exist right now. From a price point perspective, we're very, very similar to them. The jacket that I brought with me that we're selling right now retails for $249. Uh, a very similar Marmot product, product is 199 We think that we can add a little bit of a, of a premium because of our Wear One, Share One program and the social aspect. Um, and actually, we're selling right now for 119 on our Indiegogo, so they're very, very competitively priced. Um, I think our target customer is really people, well, I used to wear bright green soccer shoes to presentations, and I would say that if you think it's unprofessional for me to wear bright green tennis shoes untied, then you're probably not our target customer. We want somebody who's a little more socially aware, a little more um, uh, community oriented, and people who you know not only uh, are in the outdoor space, but really athleisure, um, a lot of different customers. We target generally 18 to 35, but I think there are people obviously that fall outside of that group. One of our partners is 65 and she loves the project. So it's, you know, it's, it's really, do you fall more into the social impact side? Do you fall more into the athletic, ath athleisure, outdoor side? And those, we have customers on both sides, I think. So um, I, I know you're in Kansas, Owens, Kansas, mm -hmm. right? Yep. So here in Kansas City, um, there are some athletic teams. Have you thought about building kits specializing in anything like that for, because I, I used to play rugby and every year we'd buy a new kit, yep. right? With a, you know, the crest of the team and all that. So have, you, have you considered going to them and saying, listen, uh, this, is, this is who we are, this is what we can do for you? So uh, kind of, uh, I'm a Sporting Kansas City season ticket member. I'm a huge fan. We're actually, just shout out, we're gonna be at the Sporting Kansas City tailgate on uh, Sunday handing out free Bud Lights if you wanna hear my spiel again. Um, you, I think that we're probably a little immature for that, but what we are looking for as professional athletes is to give that representation of us helping kids that are in the situation they used to be in, to give our brand a little more validity to that audience. Because one of the concerns that I have is to make sure that the kids actually like the clothes that we're producing, right? So if we can have, you know, let's say Kevin Durant give us a shout out on Twitter or whatever saying this is a great brand, this is, I love the clothing, I love the mission, then it gives us a little more validity in that demographic, which I think is super important for us. Um, I would love to make, you know, kits for Sporting Kansas City. Unfortunately, Adidas has them locked up till like 2021. But yeah, I think that B2B is really what we're looking at. One of our, I don't know if I'm supposed to say this, but one of our uh, first B2B clients is the city of Garden City, Kansas. Because think about it this way. Your business buys 100 jackets from us. So you get your logo embroidered on the front, ours is on the back. Not, so uh, the city of Garden City bought 200. Now 200 kids in Garden City are gonna have jackets that didn't have them before, and the city of Garden City is responsible for that. Or Black and Beach could be responsible for that. Or, or uh, Blue Cross Blue Shield. That's something that I think that we have a much more powerful story than any other brand out there doing B2B, and the cost is you know, almost consistent across the board with any other brand that they're gonna shop with. So I think that 
I would love the Chiefs to wear our stuff, absolutely, but I think that we could focus more on a wider B2B and be very successful in that space. Yeah, I appreciate that. All right, with that, we're gonna open it up to questions. Get those hands up, we'll come to you. Uh, we've got one down in front to start with. <laughs> Actually, I have several. Um, I couldn't find an actual website. I found an Indiegogo page. So it brings up the question in my head, uh, how old you are, uh, okay. how you are uh, organized, and how you hope to actually become a viable company. So related to that is the question of, are you a profit or non-profit? Because that wasn't clear to me. Yep. And, and then uh, if you are for, for profit, uh, even though the uh, give one thing is, is important, you still want to know you're buying a quality product. And I didn't think that the Indiegogo page had enough information about the jacket. All right. Well, luckily I have answers for all those. So uh, we do have a regular website. Let me first say, so we organized as a company in December of 2017. So we're very young, but we're moving full, uh, full steam. I, I'm a kind of, I wouldn't say serial entrepreneur. I don't even like the word entrepreneur, honestly, but um, I'm, I was a small business owner. I had four businesses in Lawrence, Douglas County, and one in Johnson County, and I sold them all off to be able to fund and focus on this. So that's how much I believe in it. We're very, very young. So I told my parents who just sold their house that they have to buy a new house with an extra room just in case, because Alex could be moving back home. Um, so we do have a website. It, we, we hired a marketing company in LA to uh, help us with our Indiegogo marketing. And I try not to focus on the Indiegogo because I don't want you guys to think that that's what this is about. But they asked us to redirect our website to the Indiegogo to increase sales. Uh, we got a little bit of press uh, nationwide and they were referencing our main website so we thought it would be best to push them to the Indiegogo. Once the Indiegogo closes, which will probably be at the end of this month or in the middle of June, then we'll redirect it back to our, our regular site. The product quality hugely important, and we get this all the time. Um, you know, product quality it absolutely has to be there, because it doesn't matter if the consumer buys it or if the kid gets it for free, they're not gonna wear it if, they're, if it's crap. And we recognize that. I don't, wanna, I don't wanna put my name on something that's crap. We, I've got my jacket right here, and you guys are welcome to come, you know, touch it, feel it, put it on, do it, whatever you want, and you'll be surprised how high quality this is. I mean, we're we're producing the same quality of North Face, Marmot, Columbia, any outdoor brand that you can think of because our designer works in that space and our manufacturing partners work in that space. They know exactly what it takes to create a quality product and now we do too. We just happen to be wanting, we just happen to want to focus more on the social good rather than the top of the mountain best quality product. Our, our stuff, I'm not going to say that we can compete with Arcteryx about the top quality. This, you're not going to climb, you know, Denali in this. But, can you wear this to the grocery store? Can you walk the dog in it? Can you wear it for a week camping? Absolutely. So, it's bottom of the mountain? Yes, I'll agree with that. But it's still very high quality. Question on the left. Hi. Thanks. Over here. Yeah, Hello. oh, sorry. Yep. <laughs> uh, my question is, are you a 501c3? Oh yeah, I didn't answer that. No, we're very much for profit. You're, you're for profit? Yes, we're very uh -huh. much for profit. Okay. We have nonprofit partners, but we're very much for profit. We're, we're following the same model as Tom Shoes or Bomba Socks or any other number of for profit or organizations that work with nonprofits to distribute the donated products. Yeah, well, I, I think that it, it confused me. I don't know if anybody else here was confused. What kind of, you, you, you mentioned 501c3s that you partner with them. Right. Uh, and you've got, a, you've got a social cause. When you sure. buy one, you, you're buying one for sure. someone that can't afford one. So, so I, I serve on a lot of nonprofit boards. Uh, one, of the, uh, one of the ones I work on the most is uh, Communities and Schools of Mid-America. So we serve Missouri, Kansas, uh, Nebraska, Oklahoma, and Iowa. So I'm very familiar, and I think this, this brand would translate very well into a nonprofit organization if they wanted to raise more money and produce a product. But no, we're for profit, and we're, we, I chose for profit specifically because I wanted to be able to grow this in, into a competitive brand and kind of knock the North Face and Marmot and Columbia off because they're all public companies. I wanted to give kind of the nonprofits a leg up in, in their missions. Well, my, my suggestion to you as a presenter, yeah. I, I assume you've done this before. Not much. Not much. <laughs> <laughs> You're going to do it more. Yeah. But uh, come, come out with that right away. 
you know, we're, we're a for-profit company, but we have a cause. You know, we have a mission. Yeah. Well, I've got two questions about that, so it's definitely, yeah. I have another question over here. Hi. Um, do you plan to include your branded logo on donated jackets, and how do you feel that will impact a child who is looking to fit in and may not want to be identified as a child in need? Yeah, so we're struggling with that a lot, or I am at least internally. Um, yes and no. I mean, the answer could be that that Kevin Durant comes out and says that this is the most awesome product in the world, and then kids, for, or donated or not, are clamoring to get the product, and then it's super cool, and they would love to be part of it, much like North Face is now. Or, you know, it gets kind of identified as a you know, poor kid's jacket or whatever, um, and, uh, and and then maybe we take off the badging. Actually, we're uh, going through the process of having uh, uh, heat application branding right now, so we can do. Uh, B2B easier so we can have kind of maybe blank jackets with only internal badging. I think, I mean, that's a great question that a lot of people don't ask, but that was something I've struggled with since the very beginning. I think it just depends on how well we get our mission across to, uh, how, how well we build our brand uh, awareness, how, how well we build our validity as a brand. You know, I think a lot of people think that it's cool to wear Toms or Bombas or they don't even care about the mission because they like the product so much. Hopefully that is the same thing that happens with us. Um, I think the other thing that people maybe discount, uh, I, there's a lot of millennials in here, but discount millennials and Gen Zers about how they would have pride in wearing something, you know, at high school or middle school that they know that they bought for one of their friends or somebody that went to their school. And I think the social awareness in the younger generations is so much higher than um, the older generations. I'm, I'm on the very edge of millennial and Gen X. I, I think that... Um, they're so much more aware of it now that it surprises me, and I'm starting a social impact company. So I don't know that it's going to become an issue, but we are taking measures to make sure that if it does become an issue, that we can address it. Question in the middle. You talk about the, the recipients of the, of the uh, free jacket, and then you say they have to go online to get it, mm -hmm. to redeem it. So I'm concerned that they don't have the ability to get online. And so... And, it leads to the question of what's the redemption rate of the, of the free right. jacket. Well, actually, we don't know what the redemption rate is yet, but uh, I think that's something that we can figure out. And there's, we just started like six months ago, right? So we're running our initial product run through the Indiegogo. But um, so there's a few answers. First of all, I think it's super important that these kids know how to, especially poor kids, know how to navigate e-commerce because it's only going to continue to grow. And I think if they don't get some exposure at this young age, it's going to be more difficult as they get older. Uh, it's much like, you know, your parents having you shop at a store and give them the money so you have the experience of going through it. We're trying to do the same thing through e-commerce. Our nonprofit partners are in charge of giving out the gift cards. If they feel that it's the most necessary, if they feel mom or dad is going to steal a jacket or try to sell the gift card, or if they feel like the kid doesn't have an ability to get online, or teachers, or whoever it is, we encourage them, then you sit down with them. Big brothers and big sisters is great because then the bigs can actually sit down and order the jacket with the little to make sure that it gets done correctly. We encourage the nonprofits to say, look, we can just have it shipped right to our offices if you're homeless or if there's an issue with security at your house or something like that. That way the kids are getting the jacket. Like I said, we give them a lot of latitude in how they run the program. Sometimes they're like, look, the kids are fine, but the parents really need a jacket. We're like, just do it. That's fine if that's what you think is the most appropriate. For us, from a business end, we're getting the same tax write-off no matter what, no matter who uses it. And through, our, through serializing all these donated jackets, we can see trends of the same person getting six, seven, eight jackets or, um, you know, a hot spot of areas that are getting a lot of them that, you know, we didn't recognize, like somebody is stealing the gift cards or something. So we can use our technology by serializing the jackets to identify any fraud. Otherwise, we're just going to trust our nonprofit partners. And we have memorandums of agreement with all of them saying, these are, this is the outline, the stipulations of the program. This is how we would expect you to use it. But if you have any questions, let us know. And, you know, very small business, Kansas feel. We want whatever is the most appropriate from your point of view to be taken into consideration. Question in the front left. Uh, I have a couple suggestions, if I may. Yeah. To Neil's point about not understanding, you are a not just for profit company. Yeah. You're not just for profit. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. So you might think about that like as a tagline yeah. when we talk. The second suggestion I have uh, might be that you partner up with organizations that are also social entrepreneurs, like churches, like uh, affluent churches that want to do a lot of the neighborhood. Yeah. 
Yes. Uh, you might consider that as an opportunity as well. For example, in Kansas City, Church of the Resurrection is very active in um, growing a farm. Let me take fuel. notes. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, so, uh, yeah, I think it's a very worthwhile cause. There are several causes that have been Kansas City based that have started along this line that um, are, are very successful now. That you, you, uh, if you look and follow them, you can see some real light there. So, good I luck. That. And one of the things I'll, I'll say is that uh, state bags, they're out of uh, Brooklyn, they make backpacks and every time, or backpacks and handbags, every time you buy one, a kid in a school gets one filled with school supplies, which I love. Uh, I've, I've got a great relationship with their CEO as a mentor, so I can learn a little bit from what they've done and how they've grown over the last five years. I've been in contact with Bombas Socks about doing some co-branding or uh, partnerships through marketing so we can get our product out there, but then also let people know what's going on with Bombas, because I'm wearing my Bombas right now, and they're the bomb. Um, so I'm, I'm, you know, I've, done, I've been a, a business owner before, a CEO before, and I'm, I'm trying to recognize those opportunities to learn and grow in a space that I haven't had experience in, but those suggestions, especially in the Kansas City area. So I think one of the things I was supposed to ask is, um, you know, for something that the crowd can do for me, um, and I, I don't know if I'm supposed to answer this yet, but uh, you know, I'm not, I, I'm from Lawrence and I know Kansas City fairly well, but I don't know as many people. I don't have those, the depth of relationships that I have in Lawrence and then uh, Western Kansas. So I would love if you came up to me and handed your business card. I will absolutely buy you lunch, coffee, or tequila, whatever you like. <laughs> because one of the things that I love, to, love more than anything else is making uh, new relationships and learning from other people. So that's kind of the foundation of the entire company is, is uh, you know, helping us as a for-profit, but also helping others and kind of lifting all the votes at the same time. So, Question in the back. Uh, uh, did you consider uh, becoming a public benefit corporation? Do you know what they are? Yeah. Um, is that like a B Corp? That's like a, uh, a lot of these, uh, like Delaware and a lot of these states have uh, corporate uh, uh, entities that you bifurcate your duties to your shareholders between making a profit and doing something for the public benefit. Right. And uh, I don't know if you're going to do raises or not, or, or I, I was here a little bit late, but I was thinking that something like you may be perfect, perfect for a public benefit corporation right. because it seems like you're bifurcating your duties. It, uh, by the way, you'd be taxed as a regular corporation or LLC, depending on that. It's just that you eliminate the uh, profit motive uh, part of the profit motive to your shareholders. Right, so um, we want to get B Corp status, and um, I, we, do have to have, we do have to be Benefit Corp to be able to get that status to that designation. Uh, Kansas doesn't offer, stupid Kansas, doesn't offer Benefit Corp um, recognition. So when, hopefully when we get lots and lots of funding for all you people out there, um, we're going to reorganize probably as a Del uh, Delaware Benefit um, Corporation. So. So a question over here. I come here to learn from people who've kind of wrestled with some of these common business models and the, the share model is, is, is common in the marketplace. Yeah. It brings its own challenges, its own sure. opportunities. I'm not here to judge it. What can you share with us in terms of your journey, in terms you wrestle with this? And let me just give you one example for the sake of time. I won't give you a lot more, but I'm sure you've wrestled with this. One cons consumer is gonna look at your model and say, $250 jacket, I'm buying two of them and I get one, so they're $125 jacket. Yet, if your company is mission driven, and you say, well, you know, that's not what you want, you're not our customer, right. what can we learn from you in terms of if you, as you've kind of locked in on this business model of being you know, mission driven and sharing, something that maybe we can, that, that you can expose to us that you decided to go this route that we can learn from? Okay, so um, I read a lot, like, 80 books a year or something like that. One of the latest things I read kind of reconfirmed my mission or my thought process is that, uh, I think it was an op-ed that Bernie Sanders had the most, um, most influential or, um, what's the word I'm looking for? He, he changed the most out of all the campaigns in the last 20 years. And the reason for that is because he didn't have corporate funding. He didn't have big money funding uh, from private entities. Um, most of his donations were like, you know, I think he taught it like $28 or something like that. I think that's the lesson that I've learned is that, if yeah, if you're looking for a $125 jacket, then there's lots of places that sell those. If you're looking to do good in your community, I think that it, it's not as easy as people think, even to volunteer is a little more difficult than people think. 
And so to be able to go through a company like this, get something great for yourself, get something great for a kid in need. And, you know, we're doing jackets right now, but we want to do the whole gamut. We want to do pants, shirts, you know, the whole uh, apparel line. If you want to, I think if you, if you are always the person who always says yes when they, you, will you round up to the next dollar, then I think this is a perfect opportunity for you. And if you're somebody who's shopping at Walmart for a jacket that costs 75 or or $100 anyway, then this probably isn't for you because this is more about uh, social democracy and building a better community through your actions, doing the same thing you would do anyway. I mean, if you buy, that person that you're talking about probably isn't our customer. Our customer is somebody who's gonna go to REI and spend $200 on a, mar a Marmot or North Face jacket anyway. And if you're gonna spend that $200, you're not gonna get anything out of it except for making a, for, uh, a uh, public company even richer. And it's certainly not gonna help the community. And actually, I, I call my friends out on that and they're all, when they buy a jacket, I'm like, hey, did, did the North Face donate a jacket to a kid in Lawrence when you bought that? And they're like, no. I'm like, well, we will. You know, so if that's important to you, if that's if making a difference is important to you, then I think you're our target customer because it's at that point it's the difference between 25 or 30 or 50 dollars. It's not a difference between 125 and 250. All right, Alex. Since you answered our final question already, uh, you're looking for connections. Want to meet with anybody? Let us know when we can expect the tequila. So thank you for your presentation. What's that? And then coffee. Uh, after, oh yeah. As soon as we're done, I'm offering you guys coffee already. As soon as we're done here, we're going to Thou Mayest on uh, 419 West 18th Street. Everybody that shows up and mentions one million cups or uh, Equinox and Solstice coffee is on us. Come hang out. You know, put the jacket on, do whatever you want, ask questions, let's uh, just informal meet and greet. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thanks, guys. All right, it's time for Mug Club. So if you've been to One Million Cups 10 or more times, please raise your hand. Put your hand down if you've already received a mug. Here we go. John's coming your Got way. Got one in the back. Here you go. Please tell us your name and why you come to One Million Cups. My name is Karen Felsch. Um, I am a SCORE mentor. And for those of you who don't know who SCORE is, SCORE.org is a uh, federally funded small business administration uh, organization that provides free mentoring and free classes uh, designed for entrepreneurs and for businesses that want to grow their business. Uh, so I, I come for uh, SCORE just to meet with people, and if you need a SCORE mentor, you can chat with me about it, or if you uh, want to learn about some of the SCORE classes, and they are often held here at the Kauffman Foundation. Thank awesome. Thank you for coming. Now I'm going to throw it over to Leslie for an uh, announcement. Whatever you want. Look, I'm seeing right here. Okay, so this is to let you know on Monday, June 18th, right before E-Day at the KAC Source Link, we are going to celebrate our 15-year anniversary of helping get entrepreneurs connected to the resources, and we have over 250 resource partners in our network. So what we've decided to do on this day is to allow you to acknowledge the hardworking folks that are in your area, the ones who've been out in the trenches for you, the ones that are um, don't get the spotlight for helping you test your ideas. They help you find the new markets. They help you sort out your challenges. This is your chance to actually nominate them for an award. So you'll get to nominate your mentors, like from the SCORE office, um, coaches, connectors, different experts um, that are part of our network, that are part of the KC SourceLink network. And if you're not familiar or if you don't know if who you have worked with is in our network, you can always take a look at our website um, and take a look at our resource navigator. So how this works is that um, right now nominations are open. Um, you're able to nominate resource partners whether they're past or present. Um, and you're able to do that all the way through May 30th. Um, at that point, you'll be able to vote for the people that have been nominated June 4th through June 8th. And so you'll be able to do that. Um, you should receive this on your chair on the website, the kcsourcelink.com forward slash eday at the K. You're able to go on there, nominate, do your voting and everything as well. Um, on that day, June 18th, we are going to have, like I say, our tailgate to celebrate our 15 year um, anniversary. So that's gonna be from 4.30 to 6.30. Um, it is sponsored by the Kauffman Foundation. So that's where we're going to announce who the all-star winners 
are, and you'll be able to enjoy free food and drinks. Um, and so you also have an opportunity to purchase discounted tickets if you're able to stay longer to also attend the game. So hopefully everyone will, you know, think about who's helped you along this process, who you want to acknowledge, and then make sure you come out and see that they get their recognition. Thanks. Awesome. Thank you. Now I'm going to throw it over to Kyle for he's going to show us something new and exciting. Yeah, we have something fun today. So you guys are here because you love Kansas City's entrepreneurs and our entrepreneurial community. One great way to keep up with the community is by following uh, Startland News. Uh, so they're a media outfit here in KC that follows Kansas City's entrepreneurial community. We have teamed up to put together for you a special little news recap of what's going on in the community. So without further ado, here we go. Hey everybody, this is Bobby Birch from Startland News. I'm here to give you a quick recap of last week's news in Kansas City's entrepreneur community. So first up, we've got Merriam Bay Shot Tracker, which just announced that they raised a $10.4 million funding round from investors that include Ward Ventures, the KC Rise Fund, former NBA commissioner David Stern, and NBA legend Magic Johnson. So if you're not familiar with Shot Tracker, they created a system that allows teams to track players, makes, attempts, and misses in real time. We also learned last week that the KC Tech Council released a report that shows that Kansas City's tech sector is growing like crazy. We added about 11,000 net new jobs in the KC Tech sector, and that is growing actually three times faster than Chicago's. While that growth is a bright spot, there's still room for improvement. There's still about 3,000 unfilled technology jobs in the Kansas City metro area. So lastly, in some feature news, we did a profile on Melissa Roberts, who is a KC startup champion and also a former organizer of One Million Cups. Melissa is the Vice President of Outreach and Communications at the Enterprise Center in Johnson County, but she's also very involved in the policy world and in the investment community in Kansas City. Well, that's it for this week. Again, I'm Bobby Birch with Startland News. You can get all of this information and more by heading to startlandnews.com, and I'll see you next week. All right, that was awesome. Let's give that a round of applause for them putting that together. Now, help me give a warm welcome to John with so Ass Lead-Free Brewers. Okay. <laughs> Start over. <laughs> Excuse me. <laughs> okay, please welcome John with Glasswater Lead-Free Lures. Good morning, Kansas City. Thank you for having me back here to One Million Cups, Kansas City, Missouri. I don't know if anybody here remembers me from a little over a year ago, but if so, hello to you. And let's get this thing started with a couple of questions, if I might. First of all, how many of y'all out there like to fish? Okay, and how many folks drink water? All right, I'll tell some people who didn't answer yes to either question, but we're gonna have to deal with that in a minute. Because we're not just about fishing, we're about a good environment as well. My name is John King and my wife Kathy and I have founded a company called Glasswater Lead Free Lures. Our goal is to sharply reduce or one day eliminate lead litter from fishing going into our nation's waters and streams. Now you might say, I've never heard of this problem. John, are you sure that lead litter is a big problem? Yes, it is a big and growing problem. Very conservatively estimated over 2,000 tons of lead litter from lost fishing lures and lost fishing weights go into our rivers, lakes, and coastal waters every fishing season. That's 150,000 tons of lead that has gone into our water since these products began to be mass produced after World War II. It's a growing problem for any living system. It's a big problem for wildlife, waterfowl in particular, and this bird is the one that's brought on the most attention. It is the American loon. And this is a, a, a waterfowl where a very clear link has been shown between lost lead litter from fishing and the decline of loon populations. In fact, the connection is so profound that five states in the Northeast have created lead-free fishing laws where you can't use a lead lure under a certain size in freshwater environments, and their loon populations have rebounded. What about people? Well, 2,000 tons of lead is a sobering statistic to you. It becomes even more so when you consider the fact that a particle of lead the size of a grain of salt 
can have an effect on your body. You up that to two or three grains, the effect becomes permanent, and you may even start to show symptoms. We're people. We don't have to eat a jig like a loon. We can lead degrades in the water. And we all know that it doesn't take much lead in the water to start making people sick. Now, another problem with lead in fishing is that 17 million of our fishers out there are kids. And these kids have millions of families, and they've got millions of parents that want them to enjoy a safe, clean, and wholesome outdoor experience. And as for me, I am not going to tell these sweet little faces that they have to handle a neurotoxin just so they can go out and catch a few fish. So, all right, lead's a bad deal if you happen to be a live organism. So why the heck do we use it in the first place? Huh. Well, it's cheap, it's available, and it's highly craftable. And if you're going to take lead on, then your non-lead solutions have to embrace these three very positive qualities of lead. And that's the basic premise that we use when we design a glass water lead-free lures. And that is going to be the source of, uh, of our solutions. So what do you do? Do you go to the state house and outlaw lead everywhere all the time, every time? I think the free market can solve this problem and do so profitably. Because there are 48 million fishers out there. 48 million fishers who love the environment, who love ecosystems that are clean because they know that's more places to fish and more fish in those places. So if we give these guys lead-free lures that are competitively priced, just as widely available, and just as effective, or even more so, then they will make the switch automatically. A real life, uh, they'll do it on their own. And a real life example of that is Loon Outdoors. They're an environmental company that caters to fly fishers. All their products are environmentally safe. They had about $90 million in revenue uh, last year, and fly fishing only comprises 3% of the fishing market. So we'll take the other 97% and we'll give them weights, we'll give them jigs, we'll give them spinners, we'll give them lures, we'll give them whatever tackle they want because um, we can do it lead free and it'll be just as good a tackle. And case in point is the, our first lure, I'm very excited to show it to you now, it's come from concept to completion. Ladies and gentlemen, I give you... Angle, Angle King catches them all. Bath. I got an angle on it. Pike. The angler's angle. Walleye. Found my angle. Crappie. Yes, playing the angles. White bass, wipers, and stripers. If you chase predatory game fish, now you've got a new angle. The angler's angle. Angle King. All right, that was pretty cool, right? <laughs> thank you, thank you. That. Angle King is emblematic of the way that we approach design at Glasswater Fishing Tackle. I mean, we are a tackle company like any other. We produce fishing lures to help anglers catch fish. We produce superior products so that anglers will pick us over the other guy. But because we work in lead-free materials, not only does that drive our creativity, but it opens a market of people that make environmental considerations before they buy a product. Angle King is a perfect example of what we do. Of course, it's lead free, but it, most importantly, it's a devastatingly good lure, soon to be a classic that's miles ahead of anything that's come before in terms of a spinner. Our three line tie system is what gives the lure its name. You tie it on at different points and it'll run at different angles through the water. The three line tie system also makes it so it can be retrieved at a much, much wider variety of retrieve speeds. This nice underspin here from Picasso, it's a nice bait, but if you reel it too fast, it's gonna keel over. It's gonna try to right itself. Ours, you just put it on the front tie, you can go as fast as you want. But I'm gonna tell you, this is a lure for everybody. You don't have to be a pro, just put it on that middle tie, throw it out, reel it back at a medium speed, and the fish will come to you because there's something really cool going on under the water. It's called clack effect. Ours has it, the others don't, and you're look going, what the heck is clack effect? Well, please listen here. Clack effect happens when one part of the lure strikes against another part. In this case, the front array is striking the back array to make this clickety, 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 clickety sound. That drives fish crazy. It brings them out of the weeds, it brings them to the lure with curiosity, with anger, and it gets you a lot of amazing strikes. Like, right there.
right, who wants to go fish and nap? All right, the angle king, we've got clack effect, the others don't, it's great in windy days, stained water, highly pressured fisheries, you're gonna come out with a real advantage over any other lure by using angle king. All right, so here we are. We've come a long way since I walked in here last to this warm and inviting community with a presentation and a pocket full of prototypes. We've taken, we have had a tough year, but it's been a good year. We are proud of all we've accomplished with our limited resources. We have formed our LLC, We've sold our first run of lures, we've increased our IP protection, and of course we're actively pursuing investment to move to the next level. But most importantly, we've developed our first product and put it on the market. Angle King is an awesome lure, and we make an awesome business all by itself. But I say first product because there are many more products to come. In fact, we have some that could be rolled out immediately, because the tackle company is Glasswater, and Glasswater has a mission to create a lead-free fishing future for anglers in the USA and all over the world. And with Angle King, I think we've made an auspicious start because Angle King catches them all. Thank you very much, folks. Thank you, John. We'll start with questions from our expert panel. Thank you, John, for that presentation. Yeah. Um, just a couple of questions. I'm not familiar with fishing or the industry. Um, so, one, what kind of triggered your passion to start a business like this, other than liking to fish? Like, how, what made you become aware of the, the problems that go along with that? And then, two, um, is this patented? Like, how are you going to stop your competition from doing the exact same thing that you're doing? Uh, I'll take the last one first, if I might, and that is, we, I don't have it on the, this artwork here, but we are pat pending, so we are on our provisional patent, we're trademarked and it's on our packaging now. So we, we are, that's what I said, we've upped our IP protection, that's what I was talking about. Um, now, I, I can just blame this whole thing on my daughter, plain and simple. Uh, it was in 2011 when we went up to the Northeast to look at different colleges, and that's when I became aware of the lead-free fishing laws and lead water in the water and all these problems, began to research it. Uh, my daughter asked me what I was gonna do with my life. I said, I don't know, probably the same stuff I've always done and she challenged me to get up and do something more. She said, you, you, you 50 somethings, you just think, you know, oh, the world's jacked up and I'm too old to do anything. Well, she goes, you need to keep going. You need to keep working. Uh, coaching her soccer for 10 years, it, it was gonna come back and bite me eventually, and it did. <laughs> um, and so I wanted to do something, you know, uh, change careers and get into something to help the environment, to help my sport not be a bad thing, but to help it always be a good thing. So I started this company started designing and here I went. Yeah, so I love fishing, so I appreciate this. Um, you said it catches them all, right? Uh, have you done any uh, tests to determine if it's more efficient? Because uh, I'm not sure if everybody understands the lead problem or why this is better or different, and I understand uh, the clack effect, right? Um, but every Seems like every lure has got its own thing. Absolutely. Right. So how do you how do you make this? How do you sell that? How am I going? We're going to work on marketing. Okay. Well, there's there's um, there's two things going on here. Okay. First of all, we are an environmental. We're a green company, but nobody fishes to save the environment. You go out and fish to catch fish, and that's precisely the point with this. You know, we're going to make a bait that exceeds other baits, works better than other baits, especially in certain situations. Uh, we're up to 14, 15 species on this right now. Uh, one way we're marketing it is that we, are, we have two, two basic, or actually three basic ways. One, we're going to create a network of guides, because people are always like, oh, get a pro fisherman, and I could pay a pro a bunch of money to stick a sticker on his jacket and maybe catch a few fish and that, but there's other pro fishermen out there. They're called guides. They take the bait, they use the bait, the client catches the fish, the client poses with the fish, the client's had a beautiful experience with the bait right there catching fish. We've got a customer for life. Our guides will test these baits for us. They'll give us suggestions on how to do it better, what kind of colors, what kind of combinations they want to see. Second of all, if you two, if it's good enough for Lucky Tackle Box, and the owner of Lucky Tackle Box says that's what projected his company ahead of Mystery Tackle Box, with the instructional videos on YouTube, how to use the products, and when I see what the class of 15, these fishing YouTubers are doing, we're gonna follow in that same footstep, and we're gonna have the instructions, we're gonna build up this whole image, you know, it's good to be green, we want to catch fish, yeah, but why not feel a little better about doing it by doing, using a green lure? And finally, um, 
we are going, we are actually working with some fundraising with Boy Scouts of America and so on like that because their leave no trace ethic and the family and everything else fits right in with what we're doing. Awesome. We're going to turn it over to you guys for questions. I'll get us started. Uh, John, does the clack effect work for picking up chicks at a bar? <laughs> you don't have to answer that. Uh, <laughs> My real question is, uh, congratulations on all your progress since presenting last year. Um, I know folks are excited to come over and see the lures. Uh, wh what did you actually do in between now and then? Can you unpack the last year for us and how, how you got to where you are now? Uh, sure. We um, uh, started looking at a way. Okay, when I came here the first time, and the movie was all prototypes. It was all pictures of me holding up stuff, you know. Now all the pictures are our customers and so on that have caught nice fish on the lure and sent us in pictures. Uh, we started working on uh, what a mentor at the time had said, you know, if you get picked up by a big company, you're going to have to um, be able to produce quickly. And he goes, getting, you know, you work real hard and you get picked up by a big company, that's no time to start looking for your manufacturer. So I learned how to find manufacturers, I learned how to find original equipment makers, and so on. And then we got everybody in place, and a lot of it was testing out. I mean, I must have tested 20 tails before I came up with that three-inch paddle tail grub on there um, and figured out a place where I could get it and where they'd sell it to me at the right price. Okay, so that was a big challenge. And then once we got all our, our, our manufacturing and stuff set up, we needed some front money because I couldn't just buy 100 tails. I had to buy 8,000 of them. Um, and so we ran a Kickstarter campaign, and that gave us the money to front load the company and get our inventory in place. Um, and then since then, we had, some, we had some setbacks. We had a supplier set us back, so we lost a couple of months of sales. But since then, it's been doing sales, and it's been um, getting out as much as possible and creating awareness about the lure, especially in the wintertime when people around here, at least, aren't doing as much fishing. Um, and it's just been, you know, push the lure. And in our last presentations and stuff that we've been doing, people say, hey, this is why I changed things about today, because they go talk about your company, we know you love your lure, but make sure you give enough time to glass water. So we've reworked a lot of the material in the presentations, and we've looked at other products that we can roll out right after we get going with this one. So that's pretty much been it. And then I came back here. Awesome. We have a question in the middle, but before we get started, I just want to say I remember your first presentation. It's amazing how far you've come. And it's very noticeable that you have taken everything that people said and used it to your advantage. So good job with that. Well, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you for your presentation. I appreciate your uh, wanting to do well for the environment. Two-part question. One, is there a proper way to dispose of lead lures? And have you considered using a trade-in program for people that have lead lures that might be able to use that as a trade-in to get a discount on buying an environmentally sound lure? Uh, the art. First part of the question, the only place I know is to have it is waste place where you take your paint and all that stuff, all right? Um, that's the only place I know right now. Second one, I love it. I hadn't really thought of that, but as we get going and we have enough financial base to make, you know, a discount, you know, or better yet, um, I love to get out and talk with people. I love to get out and do things. I would love to use that as a uh, gathering point for targeted customers to come. Yeah, you trade in and you give me, you know, your lead baits and I'll give you an angle king or you give me, you know, you give me so many ounces of lead sinkers. You, you don't have to have lead sinkers or lead free sinkers. You can have something else. That'd be great. I appreciate that. John, question here on your left. Sure. Uh, excellent presentation. You're a, a very dynamic presenter and, and you really you come off as the real deal. I feel like you may have been out fishing this morning before you came in here. <laughs> um, my question is, uh, is this the packaging here on the bottom? Uh, uh, this is, yeah, this is the, um, uh, the packaging we're using right now um, for display and, and to, just to get going. Okay. Um, our package now, you know, says TM on it, says Pat Pending on it, and it has a little lead-free uh, uh, insignia on it. Um, this is actually maybe a little too labor-intensive. Um, but my wife designed it, and we loved it, and it really is cool, so we're going with it right now, but I think we may have to do something that's a little easier to put together. So, yeah, my point is I, the angler's angle, really cool catchphrase, um, but a lot of the focus that you talked about is the lead-free, the environmental friendly, and I don't see anything about that on the packaging. So if I walked into the store and was looking at I, I'm just going to look for whichever one would work the best. That's a big angle for you is to put that lead-free, maybe a little blurb on the front or back. 
Absolutely. Couldn't agree with you more. We have a question in the back. I love the time you've spent on stage with us, and it's very rare that I get to tell a presenter on One Million Cups how much they entertained us. So congratulations, thank and thank you for giving us such positive energy. Well, thank you. Thank you all. Thank you all. If, if you did this all on your own with no one helping you, quite impressive, unlikely. You probably have at least one other person helping you create this message and this business. And I'm curious, because we fall into the trap of a single person somehow building a company, who's been helpful in getting you this far in your inner circle? Uh, well, she is not just an attractive groupie that follows me around everywhere. <laughs> That's my wife of 35 years, Kathy. And she has been, you know, working nonstop, uh, just incredible amounts of work. Uh, she's a designer. And so even though she's not really a fisher, she, you know, she'll just walk by and go, hey, why don't you try this? Why don't you try that? Um, when I was, you know, just a technical question, when I was trying to get the three line tie thing, I was using what are called figure eights. And she goes, why don't you just use a wire form to do that? And I was just like, why not? You know, I mean, I don't know how you even thought of that. You don't even fish. So yeah, but basically she, you know, she supports me and so on. And then we've had a few friends, you know, help us here and there. Um, the guy with the big walleye, that's Todd Bertie Birdsell. He's a professional outdoorsman. He's a professional hunting guide, but he's also a terrific fisherman. And so, yeah, we've, you know, I, I think the stuff up and then she and I, you know, just keep going bit by bit. And we've been lucky enough to get a mentor here and there to say, hey, why don't you try this? Or because when you're by yourself and you've got so many jobs, I use the clipper ship example, right? You know, you've got all these ropes and the boat and you've got to stay at the wheel. And sometimes, you know, you're not sure you're pulling on the right rope at the right time, you know, but at least the boat hasn't keeled completely over. So uh, we help each other prioritize and figure out what we need to do next. And some people have helped us say, you know, don't get so scatterbrained, focus, focus, focus. And that is how we ended up focusing on this and moving it all the way to Mark. Other question over here? Hey, I agree. It was a great presentation. So two questions for you. Uh, talk a little bit about your distribution strategy when you hit it big, right? And then after you get the distribution strategy and you hit it big, how the hell are you going to produce all the ones that you need to have? Right. Um, well, a distribution strategy, and te you know, you're getting into this kind of uh, business stuff that I come to places like this to get help with. Um, this is, uh, you know, I know right now, you know, we're just, we're just using the mail order and so on. Um, we're uh, looking at different avenues to perhaps get picked up by retail outlets, but what we really want to do is pump up just our mail order business, our online store, and so on. Um, once we get into people wanting, you know, big amounts, then, you know, hopefully I'll have, you know, some people with me that'll help me figure out how to uh, cater to that. Um, as far as producing them, my manufacturer is one of the biggest in the country as far as fishing lures go. Um, he can put out, you know, they can, they can get me into $100,000 a month or even more if, if that's what I need to go. I've been up there, I've toured the factory, I've met the guys, fantastic people. Uh, so I'm, I'm pretty sure we'll be able to meet the demand. I'm always looking for suggestions on, you know, 1099 labor, different types of labor scenarios so I can keep this lure made in the USA, if at all possible. Um, so yeah, we're uh, uh, pretty confident that we can keep up with it once we get going. All right, well, you've kind of answered this, but last question, is there anything else we as a community can do to help you? Oh, yes, of course, you know, everybody says funding, and I'm looking at, at funding, of course, but my main thing is I've had a couple of investors kind of nibble around the edges of this, and getting them to take it is what any kind of advice, how to market to investors, how to get the right places and the right people. And then that leads to the second one. We love introductions. We love people inviting us to do stuff. Cold calling is out, and if you don't have someone to get you in the door, or at least recommend you, then you know, you're not gonna get to talk to the Sierra Club, you're not gonna get to talk to the Boy Scouts, you're not gonna get to talk to the local environmental club. So any suggestions, any people like that that you think might be interested in this, might be interested in hearing me talk, or learn, learn more about lures, or all oh, my cousins in a bass club, and they're always looking to field test stuff, anything like that would be terrific. And then my, I ask this every time, and I know it's a toughie, but production processes. Where do you go to figure out how to get a machine made or find a machine that's already in existence 
but when you have something that you know could be automated, how do we get that done? Okay, so those are my asks. Thank you, John. Big round of applause. All right, that's it for this week. I uh, know we didn't get to questions for both presenters, so John is over here, Alex is over here. Yeah, you can talk to them after, uh, after we're done here. Uh, next week, we have uh, the Product Foundry and Routine Success presenting. Also, there is an event tonight with the 2030 CEO. Uh, we have a ton of these flyers in the back, so please grab one, and we will see you all next week. <laughs>